rooms, his safest bet was the fourth bedroom. Your father's dead, my mother had reported, reading a newspaper and still in her scrubs as soon as Eric and I walked through the front door. What? She'd yet to look up from the business section. I took the extension cord into the guest bedroom and committed suicide. Cerebral hypoxia. He hung himself? No, Eric, he didn't. He hanged himself. <laughs> Finally, she glanced in our direction. Interesting note. It's found with a post-mortem priapism. Priapism? Yes, somewhat irritated. When the erect penis is unable to return to its flaccid state, occasionally found in corpses who have died by hanging. I found it ironic considering it could never seem to keep it up while he was alive. Eric blinked several times in rapid succession and rushed upstairs. She was never exactly one for sugar coating. He didn't bring in the recycling bin yesterday, Francis. The following day, she told me to run to Kroger and pick up an extension cord. Same as the last one, Francis, that orange one. We never had any problems with that one. Never discussed the suicide again. Never uttered his name again. Never entered the fourth bedroom again. As far as I know, she's still living in the same nondescript Dayton suburb. Probably would have gotten a call if she died, like I did with Eric. Two years after my dad's suicide, he shot himself through the mouth. He left a note that read, chip off the old block. That's all I know about it. I didn't probe. The other sick fox offered to drive back for the funeral, but we went to Youngstown instead. One of our best gigs. Thank you. from a short essay I wrote, so it's not as fun as everyone else's. Um, but it's on like representation, representations of the child philosopher specifically through, hi, through Calvin and Hobbes, um, which is one of my favorite comics growing up, and it still is. So after facing disappointment at his father's inability to comprehend his own philosophy, uh, the titular child of Bill Watterson's popular comic, Calvin and Hobbes, states, I think grown-ups just act like they know what they're doing. Calvin's mentality and thought processes are often portrayed as beyond his years, and his music, music established him as a voice of philosophy in the comic strip. The adults of Calvin's life live a vacuous, unexamined existence, but Calvin juxtaposes their disingenuous lifestyle with his active love and exploration of the unknown. Through his youth and enlightened banter with his quasi-imaginary stuffed tiger Hobbes, Calvin is able to begin exploring the philosophical aspects of life. However, he is imperfect and frequently falls back on his childlike instincts of selfishness and vice. As a representation of philosophy, um, Calvin uh, critiques and ultimately acts out humanity's immor immor immorality, and Calvin and Hobbes together serve as youthful theorists um, on the nature of humanity in order to show the juxtaposition and balance between good and evil. So in exploring the idea of the child philosopher, it's important to know Calvin's youth in relation to Watterson's depiction of good and evil. Calvin as a child has a unique ability to be less accountable for his actions than as, uh, than as an adult. Calvin fully embraces his freedom, admitting he likes to be bad, through tormenting his neighbor Susie, disobeying his parents, and attacking his babysitter. Adults in Watterson's universe do not submit to these vices due to fear of social isol isolation, but Calvin has the boys will be boys ex um, excuse to escape permanent consequences. His age allows him to fully explore his love of mischief to the point where he moves as maybe heaven is a place where you're allowed to be bad, proving his love of vice and establishing um, himself as somewhat as a figure of evil. However, Hobbes contrasts Calvin's selfish nature, trying to influence his friend to find happiness from a life of virtue, but notes, but notes that Calvin's virtue needs cheaper thrills establishing Hobbes as a character of goodness and creating a juxtaposition between their good and evil natures. Furthermore, no matter how Calvin tries, he cannot escape his self-centered personality. In arguing with Hobbes over the state of man, he struggles with the idea that righteousness is difficult and immor immorality is pleasurable. Calvin and Hobbes often share conflicting views, displaying an image of Calvin battling his inner confliction of, of virtue versus vice. Hobbes represents Calvin's guilt and desire for morality. He tries to impart morality and goodness into Calvin, but is aware of the problems of people and that they're only human, recognizing Calvin's unsurprising and somewhat expected failures. Calvin, a symbol of humanity, is ultimately uh, fallible and succumbs to his selfish, self-absorbed, and often, often remorseful, remorseless ways. What makes Calvin's, uh, Calvin's philosophical musing significant is pairing with Hobbes. Um, as a manifestation of Calvin's uh, wide-mindedness, wide Hobbes often um, offers endless possibilities of imagination due to his, his free-spirited personality and participation in events inspired by Calvin's childlike wonder. Hobbes would be a representation of virtue, but this trait in no way limits his, imag um, his imaginative abilities, proven especially through the infamous line, scientific progress goes blank. Hobbes emphasizes Calvin's childlike exploration, for although he often critiques it, he never discredits it. 
In a similar vein, Watterson's usage of Calvin as a philosopher is effective because he's not only um, constrained by societal expectations, responsibilities, or uh, realities of adulthood. Calvin's um, exploration is, is enabled because it is unconstrained by permanent consequences. One of Calvin's most famous mistakes is the mysterious noodle incident, which he claims no one can prove he did. However, this event is only um, punished by the threat of Santa Claus not bringing in presents rather than uh, perpetual social isolation or physical loss, often associated with mistakes made in adulthood. His freedom allows Calvin uh, the immunity he needs to make mistakes and explore his own world. So as a pair, Calvin and Hobbes often contrast one another, and Watterson uses the pair to full, uh, further create a dynamic of philosophy by using them to depict human nature as inherently good with the balance of vice and virtue. One Christmas morning, Calvin is distressed that Santa goofed up and didn't bring Hobbes any presents to revel in. Hobbes negates Calvin's view as he conveniently states that tigers are naturally gifted to begin with, showing his lack of greed uh, in contrast to Calvin's materialistic disturbance. Hobbes gets a present that he claims he will treasure forever in the form of a hug from Calvin, demonstrating a balance between good and evil. So Calvin Hobbes depicts love as Watterson's ultimate solution, as the most selfish creature can find peace in love. In fact, it seems that every time Calvin uh, truly finds solace is when he's embracing Hobbes. In a moment of fear, Calvin is able to find comfort in his friends, stating, things are never quite as scary when you've got a best friend. Love breaks out Calvin's best as he begins to better understand the world around him. After experiencing the death of a beloved raccoon, Calvin understands that he can't comprehend death, but can do, uh, do the best with the knowledge he has, making peace with the process of learning instead of reacting negatively. His adoration for a lost friend breaks in peace, and his innocent love contextualizes his experiences through love he must begin to understand. So Calvin, a multifaceted uh, philosopher, is significant because his balance with, Ho with Hobbes it creates an image of humanity's harmony between good and evil. But more than that, Calvin is an effective medium for exploring questions um, of coming of age, scru um, scrutinizing answerless questions of death, religion, and the existence of Santa Claus. The child philosopher is perhaps a more effective medium than an adult thinker, for all they, although they do not have the same maturity, the child has more freedom to explore his budding wisdom due to his innocence. It is ultimately the child's uh, genuine innocence and love that makes him an effective medium for exploring philosophy, and the strip Calvin Hobbes, although somewhat an um, unorthodox medium, demonstrates the idea through friendship between a boy and a tiger. for my short story title, A Blind Stitch. Um, I'm going to start kind of in the second paragraph on page 48, if you'd like to follow along. Um, I'm doing kind of a short passage from the story, so just to give you all a little bit of context about this story, since it's kind of a little bit controversial. It's from the point of view of a pedophile, um, and so I hope you know you kind of find this story interesting and makes you uncomfortable, but also kind of excited about looking at this sort of person from a different perspective. So. At 20 years old, I took up sewing to distract myself from them. I don't know why sewing was what calmed me, but it did. At first it was easy, but eventually I needed it harder, more complicated to increase, sorry, more complicated to match my increasingly complicated sexuality. So I learned a new trick, the blind stitch. Blind stitching is the method of sewing material together while making the stitch thread invisible or close to it. Blind stitching is the method of sewing memories and thoughts together while making the stitch thread easier to bear. Blind stitching is not the method of sewing broken rules that haven't been broken into an invisible line. Blind stitching is not the method of sewing broken fabrics together while making the stitch thread stronger. Blind stitching is the method of sewing material together while redefining togetherness. Blind stitching is the method of redefining. This is my house. These are the walls I have built. I am 31 years old and I have restrictions on my television channels. Children's shows, children's sitcoms, children's channels, I restrict them all. If, while watching an adult television show, a male child, sorry, if while, um, I was doing good until you lost. <laughs> if while watching an adult television show, a male child comes on, I leave the room. If a female adult becomes pregnant, I stop watching the show. I do not watch cartoons, I do not drink alcohol, I do not do drugs, I do not take medication, I listen to CDs. I listen to J-pop and enjoy it even though I can't understand the lyrics. I have no internet in my home. I live in a gray box. Anything more colorful than neutral or earthy is not allowed. I take three showers a day and wash my hands in between. I keep antibacterial on my person at all times. I do not keep friends, friends do not keep me. So I do not keep photos or picture frames or photos in picture frames. I do not see my older sister. I do not see her twin boys. 
I do not answer her phone calls. I do see my younger sister. I do see her girlfriend. I do see their childless home. I do not go to family reunions. I do not have much of a family. I do not have togetherness. I do not define. I do have a job. I do go to work. I do work with adults and only adults. I do go to the bathroom if a coworker brings their child to work. I do not talk to my coworkers if possible. I do not excel at my job. I do not get disappointed. I like to do things with my hands. I like to keep them rough. I have built these calluses. I have built this home. I do not use lotion, I do not use perfume, I do not have sex, I do not touch myself, I sew, I sew, I sew. I sew in my spare bedroom that is not for guests, so is not a guest bedroom. I sew in that room because it is my sewing room. I sew my mouth shut. I do not look out the window, I keep the blinds closed and the room dark. I sew, I sew a stitch, I sew a blind stitch, I sew a blind stitch and then another. I sew another until the lines run together and are not blind anymore. I try to do all this and more, but even when I try to sew a blind stitch, some stitches are impossible to be made blind. Hi, my name is Delia Davis, and I'll be reading my poem, She, I, We, Me. One, Disquiet. On the patio we sit, my mother and I, and the billowing breeze that cradles our disparity, some chasm between us frothing and whispering obscene things. I swallow my saliva and feel the stiffness of my face, my cheeks and my lips, how I do not know the natural cascade of a smile, how I have never known it, but maybe once or twice. When I stop falling, Pessoa's mutilation through the streets, through the streets of Rod <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> I've been sick these past couple of weeks. But maybe once or twice, when I stopped following Pessoa's mutilation through the streets of Rua dos Tuadores and became one of the caricatures of his observations, traipsing through life in a drunken merriment, fitted with feathers and a disquiet not hidden away as I'm used to, but a disquiet that has finally become mute, deaf and mute. But like the lopsided constructs of an aspiring architect, I am better on paper, better in my head where I cannot crumble and collapse and I may sit like Soros at the window and dabble in existence vicariously. Two, discrepancy. My mother is drinking a glass of red wine. She says the word love, places it confidently next to addiction. Argument ensues. She does not understand my cultivated composure, chalks it up to naivete. I do not tell her. Her face bears the brunt of bitter communism, sober years spent in a city dilapidated by Ceausescu's reign. We like, to open up other, we like to open others up so we may pour our essence in them. Call it love, but I only see human desire masquerading cl cleverly, immortality trying to manifest itself like cancer in other human beings. My profile silhouette could do a stand-in for hers. This has followed me ceaselessly in the form of remarks from others. Her remarks are always the loudest. You're beautiful, just like me. Three, defiance. I can see her eyes water when I feed the chasm, bits of my hair and nails dead skin cells flaking away and what I truly think of sex. These picayune pieces now out of her reach. I love her, but I want to keep it this way. I want to tell her, I love you, mother, but I do not want this. I want to tell her more. I want to vomit. I do not do either. There are two paths, but only the narrator knows the paths converge. The listener cannot understand the gravel terror scraping her throat. The listener cannot possibly. My mother clears her throat. I see gasoline in her irises. I see the lit, the lit match drop. Four, delicate. We're in the kitchen, divided by plates of steamed potatoes, breaded tilapia, green beans, the salt and pepper shakers. Silence wraps a shawl around our shoulders. We chew. After dinner, I, wa I offer to wash plates. She nods. Baby conversations are exchanged. Once I can cradle in the palm of my hand. I have a headache. Yes, work today was exhausting. Yes, thank you for helping out. I set the final plate on the drying rack and listen. A clink reverberates in the absence between us. I hold still. I hear it in the presence as well. So that concludes our reading. Um, thank you guys again for coming. I really appreciate you guys coming and celebrating with us. Um, again, there are free copies of the journal on the table over there, so feel free to take as many as you'd like. Um, thank you again to Malvern for hosting us. I really encourage you guys to look around. This is a really cool place. There's some awesome like books around here. 
um, and perfect for Mother's Day. So yeah, thank you guys again. And everyone who read, um, meet me over there because we're going to take a picture together. <laughs> thank you all.